a very warm welcome to everyone to the eighth edition of the Dean's Speaker Series. The Dean's Speaker Series is a program initiated by the Indian School of Business to foster debate, engagement, and dialogue amongst leading academicians, thinkers, and policymakers who have an intricate effect and a direct effect on management practices and the industry in the Indian management context. We organize the Dean Speaker Series once every two months, and we, and we invite delegates who are directly involved in, such, in influencing such management practices in the country. We've had participants in previous occasions, such as uh, Mr. Naran Murthy, who was the founder and CEO of Infosys, Mr. Chris Gopal Krishnan, who was the chairman of Axel Ventures, uh, David Reipstein, who was a professor of marketing from the Wharton School of Business, Ganesh Natrajan, the founder of 5F World, and Professor Shoji Shiba, who was a Padma Shri awardee and a world-renowned breakthrough management expert. Today we have amongst us uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar Saraswat, who himself is one of the most prominent and gifted scientists of India. He's a Padma Bhushan awardee and has, is currently a member of Niti Aayog and was also former Defense R&D Secretary. We, wel we welcome you to the Dean's Become Series. We extend a wall welcome. I now invite uh, Dr. Rajendra Shivasav, Dean and Novartis School of Marketing, Strategy and Innovation to formally introduce Dr. V.K. Saraswat. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> So, this is the eighth uh, Dean Speaker Series event, and uh, as was uh, just indicated, uh, there are really uh, three things we want, three small things. What are the three small things? We want people who have, uh, you know, demonstrated leadership in education, leadership in, uh, um, in uh, practice and policy, but also leadership in research. It's very hard to find people who fit all three criteria. And today we are very, very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Vijay Saraswat, and uh, he has contributed on all fronts. Um, you know, since we're running late, I, I had a four-page uh, thing prepared. I'm just going to keep it to one minute here. Uh, I think we're really, really fortunate to have amongst us somebody whom I consider the foremost, if you will, on all three fronts. So if India was going to have a chief technocrat, uh, I think that would be Dr. Saraswat. So please welcome. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Saraswat. I'm, I'm keeping it uh, really short. And uh, we really look forward to your talk on inclusive growth. Is it a myth or reality? Uh, it's a subject that is uh, very, very appropriate. If we, if we look at uh, what we are trying to do at ISB itself, uh, there have been, uh, you know, many firsts that have been achieved, for example, by alums. So we are the top-ranked uh, MBA program now in the country. We're also top-ranked in finance. We're also top-ranked in entrepreneurship. We're also top-ranked in research. And now we've, uh, you know, made it to the number one spot in the world in the, per in the percentage increase in salary three years after graduation. So we've overtaken SEEBS in China. But that, I think, is the wrong metric. The real metric should be, what is ISB doing to contribute to society? And it is in this context, if you take today's topic, you know, is inclusive growth, is it a myth? Is it a reality? I think this is a subject that we ought to look at very, very closely. And this is an area where ISB really needs to contribute in the long run, because uh, I, I think, uh, if we don't do it, we are setting aside the potential that is there in, uh, in everybody who works out here, but also our ecosystem. And um, uh, I would also like to welcome uh, all the guests uh, from the community, because the Dean Speaker Series was, was actually started not only for the students. It was actually started uh, for the community. So again, uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Saraswat. Very good afternoon. The Honorable Deans, Professors, other academicians, the so-called students. This community is not uh, truly in the same fashion as I normally address uh, 
their students in other colleges because I know most of you are working professionals who are here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am told that there are some good invitees from the community. It is my great honor and pleasure to address you. You must be wondering why did I choose this subject of inclusive growth and it has been only two and a half years since I am in Niti Aayog. As Dr. Srivastava was mentioning, I was uh, a defense scientist till 2013, <coughs> followed by a stint in uh, IIT Hyderabad as a visiting professor and then of course at Niti Aayog. My relationship with economics was only to the extent of doing uh, project assessments of various uh, activities which, used to, which we used to undertake in DRDO in terms of how much it is going to cost to develop a particular product and so on. And how, to some extent how I am going to commercialize it if it is going to go into the hands of the user or in the market. But since I came in uh, Niti Aayog, I have been among large number of uh, economists to start with the, the famous uh, Dr. Arvind Pangaria, who was the vice chairman till very recently. Even today he is, of course, he will be leaving on 31st. But uh, I was surrounded by Vivek Deberoy and Dr. Ramesh Chan and many others. So it was an environment which was full of uh, economists and uh, everybody used to talk of microeconomic analysis, macroeconomic analysis. And I used to wonder where is science in all this? So there used to be kind of uh, a big chasm between us because uh, every time I heard a word called free market economy, market driven, demand driven economy. And every time I used to be quoted China or US in terms of uh, see how China has progressed and what are the matrices which we can borrow from there and then compare what we have done. But in this whole game I did not notice anywhere anybody talking about uh, either indigenous development or manufacturing. Nobody was talking about how the, how the economic, the so-called economic growth <coughs> is really reaching the, the, the benefit to the society in totality. It's only when our Honorable Prime Minister took a meeting and that meeting was not with the economists but with the scientists that I realized that there is at least a thread which is going from the top down where there is somebody who is talking about science for societal benefits. And then all the programs and projects which were uh, identified by him, he was always quoting as to how relevant they can be for the benefit of the society as a whole. And then when I took back those ideas to all my colleagues in the Niti Ayo, they said, yes, we are also doing this. After all, economic uh, growth is part of this. And that is where the word came. Are we chasing economic growth or are we chasing economic development? And since then, we have this uh, thought of whether we are really doing inclusive growth, whether it is part of our selected agenda or is it happening inadvertently. So today's talk, we are going to discuss that particular aspect. To look at this uh, slide, you will notice that I thought of giving you a closer look at what the inclusive growth could be. It will be a growth which is uh, basically uh, creates opportunities for all segments of the population and distributes dividends of increased prosperity both as in the monetary and the non-monetary terms fairly across the society. This is what the OECD defines it. And uh, it is a concept which focuses, as I was mentioning, on economic development rather than only on the economic growth. Many definitions have emanated and these definitions are basically a central idea in the development of many of the definitions are based upon the principle of equity, e equality or uh, inclusive growth comprises both outcomes as well as the processes which are responsible for this. And participation and benefit sharing, that is how the UNDP would like to 
define this. While growth still remains the most important parameter of any poverty reduction attempt, it is basically related to the redistributive growth, that is how we are distributing among all. Likely to be effective than distribution neutral growth. Many times people say as a socialist, everything should be neutrally uh, distributed. A growing concern shifted to ensuring that poor people actually are benefited from this particular aspect. And that is why it's called growth with distribution. People have tried to link this with the, what we call as the sustainability goals, which used to be once upon a time the Millennium Development Goals, which are now today the 17 sustainability goals. And inclusive growth has become an important part of that particular thing. And hence, there is a requirement for us a broader energy framework to think about inclusive growth. And that framework is a traditional approach and an approach which is with economics of uh, inclusiveness. Traditional approach, of course, one was always looking at focus on GDP and GDP as uh, the key measure of the, of the overall growth. Similarly, it used to be unidimensional, where the emphasis on the material, material living standards, that is income and how as an indicator of the well-being, uh, how the income of the individuals is progressing and how the overall income is progressing. Attention is to the representative agent that is focused on averages, that is the per capita, that is what we were all talking about, the traditional approach. Whereas when we talk of uh, economic uh, in inclusiveness, it is going beyond, there is a focus on well-being as key measure of the performance. And uh, it is multidimensional in nature, where it is income as well as non-material outcomes, that is all what is happening to health, education, and all of the jobs, employment, and so on. Attention is mostly on the distribution impacts, the different social groups, how they are getting affected is what we are looking at this. That's why if you look at how the various parameters that will decide the inclusive approach will be an integrated approach in which the community development, the economic development, the land use and the infrastructure, of course education and finally the development of the workforce which is responsible for the ultimate growth as far as the society is concerned. All of them have to be taken into account if we are looking at inclusive growth in its totality. And hence, there are national key performance indicators. For example, in the case of uh, growth and development, you have GDP, like the per capita. In the case, the labor productivity, both total factor productivity as well as the labor productivity. And then employment and health and expectancy as it is required. But for inclusion, we have the median, where does it lie? The median of the income household, where does it lie? That is more important for us to identify. The poverty rate, is it growing or coming down? Similarly, the two genies, the income as well as the wealth. International and equity sustainability, that becomes another major requirement where you have adjusted net savings, as we call it, as per PPP, or in otherwise, in terms of how the distribution has taken place public debt as a share of the GDP, and uh, dependency ratios. That is where I used to have a dialogue all the time. How much are you dependent on the others? And this ratio is both in terms of the debts and equities as well as the import, what you are doing. Of course, for sustainability, there is a major indication, and that indication is for the carbon footprint or carbon intensity, which is getting uh, an impact on the GDP of the whole system. So these are some of the matrices which are to be taken care of. I thought it is better to understand what are the three models of the, of the economic growth. Where we call normally the balanced growth. We also call the sustainable growth. We also call the inclusive growth. If you look at the balanced growth, it is sector balance, e.g. between industries. That means like today we talk of how much is coming from the automobile sector, how much in the aerospace and defense sectors and so on. Regional balances, as we say, if you look on global terms, then of course we compare among the various nations, but if we talk even within our own country, what are the each state doing and how is the balance taking place. Then of course we have the urban and the rural, which is the major divide which we are talking of in the balance growth. Internal versus external balance, that is the balance of payment, how much is the deficit we are having and balance between consumption and the investment. And that is also sometimes, if, the, if these two are not going hands in gloves, then you have a tremendous unbalance taking place. As for the sustainability requirements, of course, there is a need for 
making, making sure that whatever you are doing today meets the requirement of the future generations and hence uh, the resources which you are using today, how they are being utilized, whether it is declining resources and how we are making use of them effectively. Macroeconomic stabilities, that means all parameters which control that, financial stabilities, all of you are aware of them, these factors which are very important, they have to be taken care of as part of the sustainable growth. And environment becomes a major, again, indicator. We, are, we need to look at uh, whether the environmental parameters, whether they are pollution, whether they are in terms of uses of resources or natural capital, how they are take, made use of. But when we start looking at inclusive growth, then you have benefits of growth widely distributed as the definition which we have seen. Rising median per capita, unless this is moving, the divide will continue to increase and hence this uh, has to be monitored. Progress in reducing the relative poverty, again uh, reason wise as well as caste wise, color wise, whichever uh, denominator you will take, but certainly it is a reducing the relative poverty among the people. And providing opportunities for all in equity manner and that is where we have this uh, what we call as the equity as a major requirement and discrimination and barriers for affected groups that have to be minimized. So that this is part of the inclusive growth. Now you can see there are factors which are totally missing in the left one and the middle one, which are exclusively part of the inclusive growth and we have to look at that. Another factor is how these are related. That means if you take the in economic growth and if you take the economic development and you then compare them on the various matrices, what are the basis on which you can compare? For example, if you take the concept itself, whereas economic growth is a narrow concept which refers to the increase in the country's real output of goods and services over a specific period of time. Whereas in the economic development, it is comprehensive. It's a concept where growth and progressive changes in social, economic, political, cultural and historical, all levels have to be considered. Similarly, when you take attainment, it can be easily attained by mobilizing large resources. You can keep on using large natural resources or whatever there and probably build up your GDP. But in the case of economic development, it is difficult to realize because it involves such changes as the composition of the output which will be, which will ensure social justice and hence it is not very easy to realize. Significance, certainly we touches a lot of significance to equitable distribution of income reduction in employment and poverty, whereas here we have equitable distribution income, reduction in employment poverty. So that means here at least we have a similar approach as far as this item is concerned. Uh, how do you measure? The measurement parameters in the case of economic growth are very easy because you can say the GDP is rising so much, stock has gone up, capital output and agricultural out surpluses are so much, all these indicators are very easy to measure. But when it comes to economic development, it is non-economic factors are also included like quality of life, quality of human resources, human um, competitiveness index and so on, social organizations, how they are performing, all this is not so easily measurable. Therefore, the indicators are economic growth is a real national income and the real per capita income. If national income rises, we say we are having income growth. So, but in the case of uh, the economic development, you are physical quality of life index, human development index, that is as I have mentioned to you. Even these numbers are based upon the international scales which have been identified today. But otherwise, in the past, it used to be very difficult. It used to be how much is your literacy rate, how much is your life expectancy, how much is your employment and things like that and all of them become part of the measurement as you are likely to do as far as the economic uh, development is concerned. Similarly, relationships, it is possible for an economy to have economic growth without economic development. Whereas in the case of economic development, it is not possible. Unless you have economic growth, you can't have economic development. So that's a kind of relationship. And uh, everybody is concerned as far as uh, the economic development is con growth is concerned. Whereas uh, in the case of economic growth, I think what we development is concerned, it is mostly the underdeveloped countries which are working. That's why we talk of BRICS and we try to see whether these countries can get into this. The clear example is like China and India that have a huge GDP, 
but not label development because of their lower ranks on other parameters such as health, education, life expectancy. And it's very easy to demonstrate the difference between these two if you take, the, take these factors between these two growing economies. I would like to now address to you what uh, the former Secretary General uh, uh, um, Ben Kin Moon, he mentioned. He said that if you have to really look at uh, economy in total, a green economy is the alternative. An inclusive green economy can reduce powers, poverty and inequality. To quote him, we all aspire to reach better living conditions, yet this will not be possible by following the current growth model. He was very clear on that. We need a practical 21st century development model that connects the dots between the key issues of our time, that is poverty reduction, job generation, inequality, climate change, environmental stress, water, energy, and food security. And hence, he said, a new pathway called the inclusive growth green economy has to be really found. That's the new solution we have to look for. And for that purpose, there was identified, the UN identified at that point in time, the five blocks for inclusive green economy. Block one is the national economic and social policies, which should be so tailored that it will take into account all those factors which I mentioned earlier. Second one is the local rights and capabilities. That means one should be able to define what rights you are aiming for and what are the capabilities that will drive those rights. The building block three is the inclusive green markets. Obviously, this is very clear because uh, unless you have green markets, you, if you have non-green market, then you have problem. Then, of course, you have harmonized international policy and support. That's a very important point. Ma watch the word harmonized. And in fact, that is the dialogue I always keep between uh, with, the, with the economists. Many of you may be pursuing that with the free market economy when we talk. Is the internationally free market economy harmonized? Is there, a, 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 we, can we say that there is no bias in this free market economy. That means non-harmony exists. The subsidies, the type of protectionism which various countries follow, but they still say that the free market, take China for example, the kind of subsidies it provides which are not highlighted in the cost structure of the products which they are delivering, then certainly there is a, there is a hidden agenda and that harmony, if it is not there, then you will have a major impact on the inclusive growth. Building block five is new matrices for measuring progress. And that's why UNDP, OECD, all of them have been trying to always work out the new indices, whether it is human competency index or innovation index or health parameters or whatever that. So these blocks are very, very part, important part of, the, of this particular thing. So these can be also categorized between local and immediate benefits. What are the uh, and how much of the impact it will make as it is shown, whether in terms of uh, irreversibility or in terms of the risk. For example, if you take the lower ones, which is the trade-off exists between the short and the long term and the local and the global benefits. For example, the action is urgent in some cases where you can say that we have lower carbon footprint, higher cost of energy supply. We, can, we are doing that today. Carbon pricing we are looking at, stricter waste and water management. But if you want to go for long term and uh, policies provide local and immediate benefits, then drinking water and sanitation, solid waste management, lower carbon and the low cost strategy, that is for the energy, low loss reduction in the electricity supply, that means minimizing the losses and so on. Same is the case when you talk of higher cases where the action is urgently required. For example, reduce deforestation. For example, coastal zones and the natural area protection and uh, fisheries cash management, these are all immediate actions required. But in terms of the higher one, land use planning, and that's why Niti Aayog did a major reform on the land use today. Land laws and land use planning, it is uh, one of the major priority areas. Public urban transport, this is another major thing. Family planning, uh, sustainable intensification in agriculture and large scale multipurpose water reservoirs and things like that. So these are again strategies which drive the, 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 the complete thing. There is a vision for inclusive green economy and uh, the objectives of the vision are that you have reduced environmental risk and uh, ecological uh, scarcities, enhanced economic progress and improved human well-being and social equity. These are the objectives. 
If these objectives have to be followed, then there are about nine major principles which needs to be followed. For example, improve the measurement and valuation of the natural capital. It should not be like what happened in, uh, in, in Karnataka, when you really lose your natural capital for the benefit of a few individuals. So there is a measurement requirement. Promote the internationalization of the negative externalities and sustainable use of the natural capital. Again, how do you use your natural capital in a sustainable manner? That becomes important. Enhance ecosystem and ecosystem services as part of the ecological infrastructure. And that is where all your infrastructure has to be green and in, that has to be put in form. Shift the consumer behaviors towards sustainable consumption patterns. This is actually leading to circular economy, if you look at it. That means how much will you are able to change the behavior in a manner that the wastages are minimized and you are using, minimizing the resource utilization but getting the best output of it. Develop and clean physical capital for sustainable production patterns. Again, as we call as sustainable production systems today, where you have green, you have lean, you have everything. Promote green and fair trade. I mentioned to you about the biases. That is, again, requirement. Increase green and decent jobs while developing the necessary human capital. This is one major requirement where human capital development has to be focused as part of the inclusive growth. Improve access to the services, healthy living and well-being, and promote public participation and education for sustainable level. This is the most important part. And that is where Niti Aayog is coming today. Niti Aayog's main agenda today is to improve this public participation and cooperative federalism. And hence, some of the major vision of the inclusive green economy, they are being actually followed here. Challenges are there and opportunities are there in both cases. What are the challenges? Like the ecosystem decline and the loss of uh, ecosystem services. Obviously, the objective would be to go for uh, larger values, demand for biodiversities and things like that. Natural resources and scarcity and competition. Again, we had to look for demand for sustainable agriculture, demand for improved natural resource management and local resource rights. This is again becoming a, a repetition of what we are talking about, uh, managing your natural resources. Vulnerability to the climate related risk, and that is what we are facing today in agriculture. Resilient to the climate change, resilient to the system, either the production system or the agriculture system, one has to, this as an opportunity has to be taken. Prices of the fossil fuels, that means demand for renewable energy and energy efficiency, and uh, demand for public transport and alternate fuels to minimize the import of, the, of, the, of these things. The transition to an inclusive green economy will be specific to economic, uh, social, and environmental, and political context of each country. There is no one solution that fits all. It has to be actually tailored based upon your own requirements. Uh, the diverse uh, factor which most of the people miss out is the informal economy. When we take the informal economy, you see how many of these things are part of the informal economy we have. For example, farming, small farmers, services, the transport, street food restaurants, the rag pickers, repairs of cars, shoe wallas, electric household, the construction, building construction, welding companies, electricity, diggers and washers, craftsmen, production, timber and charcoal, load processing. So a whole lot of uh, unorganized sector is actually excluded when you talk of this growth, and, but it has a tremendous impact and that is what is shown here. You see here, if it is despite the focus, and this is world over by the way, it is not just for India. You take the uh, focus on inclusive agenda, only 25% of the countries mention the informal economy in their ambition plans for action, only 25%. And uh, this is what of course Oliver Greenfield said, we must know what green growth means for the informal workforce and start working out how it can get a stake in this agenda. In fact, we are also missing it out. We actually, 45% of our GDP comes from the, from the unorganized sector, but we always miss that out. Even when we were working out our GSTs, we actually again miss them out at, at a major stage. So we had to really take care of that. So only 15 out of the 60 national green economy plans, about 25% make explicit mention of the informal economy. All these have implications for informal enterprises and yet there is not much thought given to how green growth will work 
in the as far as the incoming sector is concerned. So that's another major area which is absolutely needed. There are uh, pathways because I mentioned to you about the sustainability development goals. What are the pathways which will drive and take us close to the sustainability development goals which are the inclusive pathways. Same thing, green economy, pathway for poverty reduction. That means ensure access to an equitable management of the natural capital, ensure access to the safe water and sanitation, improve air quality, increase demand for the low carbon goods and expand access to the renewable energy. These will also ensure that if we do that, rights and empowerment, like we talk of today, women's empowerment and so on, livelihoods and employment, health and well-being, education, and resilience and security, all of them become uh, uh, essential. And if you do all this, then you will satisfy the goal one, which is uh, eradicate the poverty, goal two, which is universal primary education, three is promote gender equality, fourth is the child uh, mortality, improve maternal health and combat major diseases and ensure environmental sustainability. If I give you these numbers, you will be surprised. We will, I will give you those numbers later. But we lack in most of these matrices. We, we lack and our main concern is that. In a system like that, unless you have a framework setting, economic framework setting, and what is that economic framework setting? It is related to two things. That is economic inputs and the economic outputs. Economic inputs are the human capital and the physical and financial capital, which is related to productivity and the competitiveness. That means you should be able to make this happen. For this to happen, then only you will get economic stability and economic development. But each one of them have got various factors. For example, economic stability means your fiscal deficits, your volatility of the fiscal revenue, your discretionary spending, your money inflation rates, exchange rates, and of course your trade relations policy. All of them should form part of your uh, basic uh, framework. Similarly, when you talk of uh, human capital, which is again as an input it is going, you have a total workforce. You, what, how do you control your unemployment rate? How do you create more jobs? And uh, for creating more jobs, what are the policies we have taken? Your dependency ratio, both on import and export, and GDP output per employee, etc., which are the human capital. And not the least, the skill development, particularly in the changing environment where the shift is taking place to 4.0 industry, shift is taking place towards other areas in which automation and machine learning and everything is going to become. This becomes a major important requirement because it is not just a skilling in the traditional manner, but we have to skill our young workforce for the future. And the future is the new skills, unlearn and relearn the new skills. And basically, HDI and so on. Productivity, as I mentioned to you, both TFP as well as labor productivity and competitiveness. Economic development, where we have looking at sustainable growth and economic diversification. Physical and capital, how do we make use of your natural resources, current account, net exports, net oil, not. So all this framework will ultimately dictate the economic output. So if we are looking at inclusive growth, as part of the economic, de economic growth and the economic development, the amalgamation of all of them is essential. Then only you can reach the inclusive portion as we were talking about. I mentioned to you a circular economy. Basically, it is a concept in which the, to get the inclusiveness, one has to go for reuse, recycle, redesign, and again maintain and go back to minimize the wastage and things like that. The circular economy concept is emerging in a big way as part of the inclusive growth profile because larger, larger consumption of the natural resources without actually replenishing them is a disaster and it is against the complete sustainability norms as we are talking of. So it is important for us to resort to the circular economy. Now let's look at India. With this background, what, are, what is India doing today? If you see our numbers, they are staggeringly Somewhere we are doing well, somewhere we are doing well. We are a seventh largest country with 29 states and seven UTs. We have a population of 1.27 billion, 71% in the rural areas and 50% below the age of 25. That is our distribution today. You have the uh, fastest growing economy in the world, GDP growth rate of about 7.6 in the fiscal year 2016. 
But uh, you see other data, if you see other data, you will notice that you have mobile penetration 71%, internet penetration 8%, social penetration is about 3%. India is big, there is no doubt about it. You have a form of the country where we have federal republic with 29 states and 7 union territories. You have population of 1.27, second most populous country, second largest English speaking country after the United States. Economy, if you look at the economy, we are uh, about 2 trillion at the current prices and third largest in terms of the PPV terms. If you do our literacy, which was after the 2011 census, it is about 74 percent. Unemployment, 4.9 percent. This is older data, but uh, <coughs> our GDP share in terms of distribution, if you use services, we are doing well. We are going about 60 plus percent and industry, we are going about 23 percent. Agriculture, which we want to increase, is uh, on the both industry as well as in the agriculture, our contributions are poor. FDI have been good, where we have uh, almost in about uh, 15 years, about $265 billion. And last one and a half year to two years have been a very steep rise in the FDI as far as we are concerned. This is our macroeconomic uh, data, if you look at. You see the other aspects like the mobile internet penetration, about 300 million users estimated and uh, our forex reserves are good. We have about 350 bill, two billions. Our uh, parity with the, for example, with the other currencies, for, uh, we are about 100 pounds, uh, 100 rupees per pound. You have 66 or per dollar and euro 72.5. We have uh, the, the almost about uh, 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 companies in the 500, almost about seven companies are in the Fortune 500. So, uh, if you look at the overall scenario, it sounds nice. But what is happening to the inflation? Inflation is likely to remain below 6 percent, though there have been recent rises in the last three months, and decline is there in the fiscal deficit. If you see here, uh, what used to be once upon a time and where we are now as far as the fiscal year. So, there has been a good improvement. If you look at the upward trend in FDI, yes, we have almost, as I mentioned to you in 15-16, we have a almost $16.6 .6 billion of FDI. We have greater emphasis on capital expenditure today and uh, that is again visible here on this graph that uh, we are spending much more on capital today. So, these are good indicators. But we need to push these stall projects. We have a large number of projects. That is where there is a gap between planning and implementation. Your large number of projects are stalled worth about, about 160 billion. This is the figure up to about 3112. There has been a resurgent as far as this is concerned, but I think it has not improved significantly. All of you are aware of the NPA situation, what we are having today. We have a fairly large percentage of uh, non-profitable assets. Declining power load factors as a result, 62.2 percent in financial year 16. Poor financial health of the discounts with debt of almost about 67 billion, what they are uh, suffering from. And need to increase exports to achieve a higher growth rate. Our export import balance is very, very poor. So, this is a, another thing. So, basically, if you look at it, India lags in the inclusive growth. This is what the numbers indicate. Now, if you see how it uh, lags, the, the inclusive growth index, uh, the various colors are indicated here. For example, China by this and India is in this color. If you see all the bars against education, against employment, against asset building, against financial intermedi uh, intermediation of real economic investment, corruption and rents, basic services and infrastructure and fiscal transfers, in all cases, we are below most of the countries which are China, Brazil, Russia and South Africa. Now, that is a concern and we have to do better if we, if we want to really uh, say that we are doing. Say, same is the case when you talk of uh, quality of overall infrastructure and quality of domestic transport on a scale of 1 is to 7. Again, we are much below the rest of the lot. Similarly, access, sorry. Similarly, access to the electricity per uh, percent of the population, slum dwellers percent of the percent or households with internet access, again our 
numbers are fairly low as far as uh, comparisons are concerned. So India lags in the inclusive growth. That is uh, what we are seeing, despite the fact that last two years we have been having our economic uh, growth going close to 7 percent. And people are predicting that this year also it will be close to that. So uh, certainly these are, there is a disconnect. That is what I am trying to bring out. Uh, you see here the same thing uh, in terms of the, the, the mobile connectivities. Uh, you have, uh, we are somewhere here, for per 100 population, we are in a single digit, uh, whereas other, for example, you take China, is almost 20, and uh, you take uh, mobile internet or you take the affordability of the fire broadband, again, percent of the population, we are, again, except in this particular case, where the broadband is going closer, we are not doing well. These same figures have been indicated in terms of a performance index on a scale of 7. For a population of 1.29, for a GDP of about 2090, and uh, you see the global competitive index of our country is concerned. We are 39th among the 138 countries. That is, uh, this is our ratio. If you take the sub indices, institutions, on a scale of seven, we are close to four on all institutions, infrastructure, macroeconomic involvement, health and primary education. These are all, we are ranking on the scale on 138 close to this. Our ranking on that scale of seven is four, 4.5, seven in these matters. Except I would say in the case of market size, and that is purely due to our large population, we are close to 6.4. For example, technological readiness, we are so poor, 3.0. And, uh, and our ranking also is 110 out of 138. So if you look at all of them, we are certainly, these indicators are a clear, clear bulb which tells you that there is an issue. Uh, it is just not the GDP. We have to be doing something more than that. So government needs that stability, sustainability and inclusive growth happens only by the participative mechanisms. To bring participation, government have to bring socio-economic development rather than just economic development. And SED happens only when basic necessities of society are fulfilled, that is the social needs are fulfilled. From, so we need a shift, the standard paradigm no longer serves us. What is the shift? From GDP as a compass of progress to improving societal well-being, rising inequalities despite growth, and lion's share of growth concentrated at the top. That has to go. From growth or redistribution to inclusive growth, that is inequality likely to affect the growth. And from income to multi-dimensional living standards, inclusive growth targets, strong growth and tangible improvements for people's quality of life across society, both in terms of higher income and better living standards. That is a strategy we have to adopt. What are the tools that you can use? The various tools, these are possible to be used and those are, for example, tools we can use is multi-dimensional policy framework. We need to change our present policy framework. Instead of a single dimension going up the ladder on the GDP, we have to make it a multi-dimensional policy framework. Consultation and engagement, and that I mentioned to you, that is one thing which the Niti Aayog is up to. Cooperative federalism, consulting in policy planning and planning process. Understanding what the citizens would need, and that becomes another important thing. Integrated outcome-based performance. Earlier, we used to always think that, okay, this program, we have spent $500 million in a particular poverty elevation program, but we never actually looked at what are the outcomes of that. So the Niti Aayog today talks of only outcome-based performance, and hence, outcome-based performance models have to be part of our, our, our system and mechanisms to inform policy making. Many things people do not know. And how do you arrive at that, that transparency is not there. So that is also important to bring in. Access and reach of services, which we are doing today fairly well. We are trying to make services go to the farthest corner in our country. Mitigating the risk of capture. This is another one we have to keep hammering at. And so these tools are very good tools, which can be certainly made use of. And for that, the government of India has started many opportunities. 
And those opportunities start with Make in India. Many of you are aware of them, where we have goal to go to 25% as far as our production is concerned. We have uh, competi uh, com competitive federalism, a system of ranked states. We are, uh, this is one thing which Niti Aayog is doing today. Again, ranking the states with respect to uh, relative performance on various performance indicators. Regulatory framework like FDI norms in 15 sectors have been liberalized. We have gone to 100% FDI and things like that. And distinction between uh, foreign direct investment and the foreign portfolio and FPI and FIPP and all have been removed today. Similarly, we have housing for all a program. We have a smart city program where you are trying to reach uh, almost 22.5 billion to create about 100 smart cities and rejuvenate 500 cities through the Amrit program. Ease of doing business, all of us are aware of it. We are more and more digitization is basically bringing in to reduce the rat tapism and uh, improve our business. We have uh, hygiene infrastructure. We have the social Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. Roads and highways today accounts for almost about 90% of the India's PPP infrastructure in the public private is in the road sector. One trillion uh, investment from 2012 to about 2017 in the road sector. So there's a huge thing going on. Same thing is happening in the renewable energy. We have a target of setting up almost about 175 gigawatts of power in the renewable form, out of which 100 gigawatts should, gigawatt should be in the solar alone. Financial inclusion, we have today this trinity of GEM, that is, uh, which, which is basically to make the 900 million mobile users to bank accounts as well as to identification numbers, the Aadhaar digitization which is happening. Railways, we are increasing our network and same thing is happening in the construction sector. So there are opportunities, Skill India as I mentioned to you is a major requirement, 300 million youths to be skilled by 2022. The, the so-called demographic dividend, if you want to really reap, which is going to remain only till about 2037, because after that, we also start having an <laughs> aging population. If this needs a very high pace of skilling of this young population, then only we'll be able to get the required inclusive growth, what we are looking at. We have the young and the restless, the projected population in 2030, as I mentioned to you, Labor force surplus deficit by 2030 is going to be about 47. Similarly, projected median age, we will be in, in 2030, we will have the minimum median age at the time and uh, we will be 32. Economic prospects during this CAGR will be about 6.7 at that point in time. So, so much will be, whereas others will be going into the negative mode at that time. So, you have uh, the young people who can contribute to the actual situation. So new age entrepreneurs, favorable ecosystem to spur innovation and uh, approximately 1.5 million engineering graduates every year are coming. Two billion rupees were uh, spent in uh, one and a half years last year in Bangalore, Chennai and uh, Pune and Hyderabad. That is the kind of startups that came. Of course, the story is slightly get disjointed or disconnected. When we see the number of them, it survived and number of them got into this. But the fact remains that there is money available. If you have innovation, up your string, then it's possible. Rising rural and middle class market, certainly there is a big change taking place and fourth largest base for young businesses today. So these are opportunities for the young. Uh, it is high on our agenda today, inclusive growth, because one billion unique identification numbers created to better target support to the poor. We have 276 million bank accounts opened for the poor since August 2014. 34 million toilets built since about 108 villages electrified. So there is, a, there is a, an approach which is taking us towards inclusiveness. But is it good enough? That is for all of us to make an assessment. Structural reforms are also taking place. All of you know that. And these are certainly like the key reforms like the GST, financing system of the states, FDI deregulation, bringing the bankruptcy law, inflation targeting, and budget uh, making process, which has also been modified now. And uh, key ongoing reforms are competitive and cooperative federalism, as I mentioned to you. Subsidies, oil, food, and fertilizers, even that are being slowly uh, regulated. It is not open. 
Today, even today we are talking of oil subsidies are going away, food subsidies are direct transfers, fertilizers also there is a move to go for DBT, financial inclusion, cooperative uh, income tax, tax evasion and banks and labor, all of them are the major uh, you know reforms or the structural reforms which are going to ultimately lead to the inclusive growth. The, if you look at uh, digital innovation, demand side impact, what it is going to make, new goods and services are coming because of that and uh, better quality and lower prices, responding to the needs of the disadvantaged and excluded groups, quality of life will improve. Supply side is market conditions, winner take all markets, concentration and creative destruction, changes in returns to labor and capital startups, labor demand, new business models for micro, so all of them ultimately give you opportunities to improve retail platform or for collaborative consumption or operating business like Uber and so on. There is this tremendous change which ultimately will affect the inclusive growth as far as, so the steps are there and all these steps are ultimately on the long run going to improve the, all the matrices what we were talking just now. <coughs> There are some of the flagship programs which government has initiated. For example, robust connectivity via enhanced infrastructure, railways, roads, inland waterways and Sagarmala project, housing for all by 2022, make in India and smart city mission, power for all, 175 gigawatts of the installed capacity of renewable energy, digital India, Jandhan Yojana, Skill India, Startup India, national mission for clean Ganga. <coughs> all of them have got tremendous employment opportunities as well as increase in the GDP. <clears throat> for example, housing for all, it will boost the relocation of population of slums into houses, boost in economy sectors like cement, iron and steel which supply inputs for construction, will be one of the leading beneficiaries because of this. Increase in employment generation because the labor intensive tasks will be there and business opportunities in real estate sector. So that is the advantage for housing for all. Make in India will certainly improve the, the basic employment as we have seen this setting up of the Invest India agencies like JVs, FIC, DIPP, targets of net zero imports by 2020, difficult to achieve but certainly there is a, there is a requirement and I hope we succeed in this. The automotive mission plan to make the country among the top three automotive industries in the world and besides investment of US dollars 260 to 300 million dollars. This is what is happening. Smart cities, as I mentioned to you, almost 100 cities to get about 100 crores. It is going to give another great advantage. And uh, it will have ICT integrated with the township planning and infrastructure such as power and uh, smart buildings and things like that. All this will certainly uh, bring, uh, you know, spur growth in all sectors. For example, you take the, the, per, the, the power, renew, renewable energy, as I mentioned to you, 175 gigawatts, and out of that, uh, about 100 gigawatts is the solar, 60-40 is the ratio between rooftop. We are doing well in the solar PV, but solar rooftop is still to pick up in a big way, wind and biomass and so on. So this is another major program which will bring uh, inclusiveness. Digital India. I don't think I have to explain much because certainly the reach is going to be almost 250,000 villages uh, by 2019 and it will certainly give you increased business opportunities in the tele through telecom sector in the health, education and uh, doing the business. Certainly it is going to be seen. These are some of the major advantages of digital India, broadband highways, public internet access programs, information for everyone early harvest programs, so outreach to the farmer, universal access to the phones, IT for jobs and e kranti the electronic delivery of services, reforming government through technology that is e-governance and electronic manufacturing which is the major uh, thing in the industry 4.0. Jandhan Yojana, DBT is going to reduce the leakages, it is already seen, there is a tremendous impact of DBT on the leakages and uh, today the benefits are really going to the required person. The business opportunities because it is coming through ICT, user payment, digitization services. So jam number tr trinity is certainly helping the inclusive growth. Skill India as uh, Koshal Bharat, Koshal Bharat I mentioned to you, almost 234 million has been earmarked for uh, the skill development program. 
only the rate at which this, uh, the, the benefits of this program are being reaped by various institutions is a questionable at the moment. We are not seeing the same kind of a rate, but certainly there is a major uh, gain there. Startup India, Stand Up India, I mentioned to you the kind of investment that has happened. You see there is a MSME fund of about 10,000 crores and uh, the utilization of that uh, among the MSME industries is not even 1,000 crores in the last two years. So while there is a allocation, but the propensity to take risk is so poor that uh, we, are, we are not able to make use of the even available in, uh, thing. Startups are exempt from paying IT on their profit, 80% exemption in patent fees. So some of these very, very progressive uh, you know, reforms are there to promote uh, the startup industry in the country. Some people have made use of it. Infrastructure and railways is increasing, except for the accidents what we had. But certainly we have uh, fairly large uh, uh, track, high speed railways coming, dedicated freight corridor is coming. All this is part of this investment of about 133 billion year marked in about 2019. So this is uh, Swachh Bharat Abhyan, all of us are aware of it. But without technology, nothing can happen. And that is where the emphasis of the government is also there on uh, bringing in technology benefits as the technology is growing. And hence the uh, technologies, there are about 12 empowering technologies for India, which will certainly help. For example, you take mobile internet, inexpensive and increasingly capable mobile devices and internet connectivity enables services to reach. Cloud technology, computing capacity increases, storage increases, automation of knowledge work, intelligent software for unstructured analysis, capable of language interpretation and judgment based tasks. Digital payments, I mentioned to you, verifiable digital identity, it certainly helps in doing all the business today, access to the government services and so on. Internet of Things, it is going to come, it is coming already, we are networks of low cost sensors and, adjust, and uh, adjusters to manage machines and objects. It is going to be a big business, in fact people say that almost 200 billion would be there as far as IoT is concerned in the next about 3 to 4 years as a market. So intelligent transportation and distribution systems, advanced geographic information systems for agriculture and others and next generation genomics, all of these have got tremendous advantage as far as the impact rather, as far as the, for example, advanced oil and gas exploration and recovery, where we are using the carbon dioxide or the methane or renewable energy or advanced energy storage, all these technologies are becoming a major impact factor. And what is the kind of impact they will have? For example, it is estimated by the OECD that annual, sorry, that the annual uh, uh, economic impact is almost about 552,000 billion, 20 to 30 percent of India's incremental GDP between 2012 to 2025 because of these 12 technologies. Additional people with access to equity will be about 400 million. People with financial inclusion, 300. Workers who could gain more years of education, almost 24 million. Yield improvement for the farmers will be about 15 to 60 percent. Why this variation? Because this is basically regional. Some regions you will have a large. Savings and productivity gains from energy technologies, 50 to 95 billion. Economic value from intelligent transportation will be about 25 billion. Tech enabled workers in healthcare, education, agriculture, citizen services and financial services almost about 10 million. And non-farm workers who will need new jobs opportunities about 19 to 20 line workers. So see the type of impact these, econ these technologies are going to have. And certainly the need for us is to make these technologies as robust as we can and by participation of all concerned. How does the economy look like? Where does it take us? In India, if India continues in its present growth course, it would have, uh, it could have a US dollar 5.6 trillion economy in 20 years. That is from 2014 where you are 1.9 trillion, you can go to 5.6 trillion if you follow the same. But if you do a faster growth, then you can reach 10.24 and that is at 9% CAGR growth rate, you can do that. So the baseline is you may reach this, but if you have to reach here, you have to do what is called as I mentioned to you. So in the inclusive sector, what are the things one has to look at? 10 vectors of growth are identified. One vector is healthcare, for example. 
If you want to improve the uh, life expectancy from the today 66 years, by 2034, you should be reaching 80 years. This is one of the objects. Second one is education, keeping children in school. Today it is less than seven years. If you want to keep the children in school up to 10 years, this is the path 2034. This is another objective. Improving productivity, we are producing four tons per hectare today. And uh, our goal is to go to 7.4 tons per hectare. So that is the kind of increase. Providing banking to more people. Today we have about 35% uh, access by 90% access by 2034. Manufacturing, as I mentioned to you, today about 12 to 15% and we go to 25% by the end of 2034. Retail, you have 8% uh, share, that is increasing market share of the organized retail. Uh, you should be able to go to 50%. Power, as we mentioned, today is about 76% access. It should go to 100% access. Urbanization, about 400 million people, it will become 650 million people. Digital connectivity, 15% should go to 80%. And uh, physical connectivity should be about 8% to 13% of GDP to about 8% of GDP. That is reduce the logistics cost. That is what we are talking about. These are some of the objectives for the inclusive growth if you really want that the present economic development model uh, really proves well. For doing that, we have uh, three possibilities. A fierce catch-up using traditional approaches or technologies to surmount challenges at an accelerated pace. A significant leap, as is shown in the figure, adopting new or different approaches and technologies that may have been developed elsewhere, but that would also work in India. We have to look, for example, what is happening. People talk of China, people talk of Brazil, people talk of South Africa. I think many of those things what they have adopted are valid for us also, and then they can be done. And if you really want to go to the 10.4, skip a generation or create an entirely new method of business model for the technology. That is more important. And then only you can really do this 1.9 trillion to the, that is unblocking and executing the existing methods. That will take you to the fierce catch up but that will bring only 60% change. But if you want 100%, then you have to go for the 40% new uh, solutions, which th will take you to the leapfrog, and then only you can become the uh, real economy with inclusiveness. And uh, for doing that, it is not without human beings. Inclusive leaders drive organizational growth in 21st century. Biggest challenge is create uh, growth. And to have growth, you need to differentiate. And for differentiation, you need to innovate. And uh, to innovate, you need diversity. And for diversity, activate the diversity, you need inclusion. And friends, to manage all this, you need people like all of you here, the inclusive leadership, the so-called great leaders who are sitting here. They need to be part of the inclusive leadership program, then only countries will say inclusive growth is not a myth, but myth it is a reality. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very, very comprehensive uh, overview of the Indian economy. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. No. Yeah, please go ahead. Sure, sure. Uh, so we're inviting questions and answers. Uh, we'll limit it to five questions for the session so that we can wrap it up by 2 o'clock. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Safikir and I'm a professor in a business school in Hyderabad. Uh, in one of his addresses, uh, either in, uh, during the Independence Day or Republic Day, 
uh, address. Uh, the Prime Minister had, talk, had uh, spoken about three Ds, uh, democracy, demography, and demand. Uh, Mike, having been part of the education sector uh, for about 15 years, having worked with the UNICEF and now with the business school, my primary concern remains the quality of human capital. I mean, whatever the media says, I mean, we have to discount what the media says about uh, uh, some of the skill, skill development activities we are taking. You know what NSDC has done. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, more than 74 crore Indians are, are under the age of 65. What is even more startling is for the next 20 years, every month, 1.1 million uh, youth will be entering the workforce. They are not properly educated. They do not have the skill set. I'll give you McKinsey, uh, uh, NASCOM report says less than 20% of engineers are ready for a job. Uh, the program for international student assessment, PISA, says we are 133 out of 180 odd countries as far as mathematics and English uh, uh, proficiency, proficiency is concerned. My, my question, sir, is what are the specific initiatives that the government of India is doing, A, to skill them, and B, to assess what kind of skills they are acquiring? <coughs> See, the skill development mission, which I was uh, from Niti Aayog, I was uh, part of that. Uh, first of all, when the Prime Minister formed the Niti Aayog, the first task which was given to Niti Aayog was to dwell upon, along with the chief ministers of various states, on how to improve their skill development. Because the D which we mentioned, he is concerned about the demographic aspect. And demographic dividend can come, as I mentioned in my talk also, only if you have the human capabilities en enhanced. So we had a, we, we had a major discussion and we, we, nine chief ministers came out with a report in which identified what are the various uh, matrices which has to be followed to say that yes, this workforce is now actually skilled. What are the sectors which need skilling to be done? So there is a correlation established between the industrial needs or the needs of the nation with the, in each sector, each, each domains and uh, which sector needs to, give, to be given a larger push. So this exercise of pre preparing a matrix has been done. Then how do you manage the skill development? Now there are various issues on the skill development which have been responsible for skills not getting developed. And some are cultural issues, some are issues with respect to management and some are issues with respect to identifying the right uh, you know, agencies to do that. To that extent, uh, three things were done that first of all revamp the existing infrastructure in the country of the ITIs and the LME colleges and things like that and convert them into multitasking uh, institutions. They cannot remain only institutions where you are teaching, um, you know, engineering like fitting, labor, welding and things like that. They, they have to be canvassed larger. You have to bring tourism, you have to bring computer education, you have to bring other skills which are relevant today, as I mentioned to you. So even that has been done. Second thing is to give actually a, what is called a, a, a kind of a recognition to a guy who gets skilled. Today if a guy is asked to go and join a vocational course, he is deemed unfit for the normal education, that's why he is going to a vocational course. I think we have to get out of it. So parity between the educational stream and the vocational stream has been established and even to the extent of going that one would go for a university for vocational the skill training, even <coughs> to that extent. So you have one, two, three, four, five, about ten levels of skills have been identified which is in co correlation with the other educational steps what we have. Then of course management like the National Skill Development Council and the other things and major recommendation has been that every state has to have a skill development council. And that Asked while uh, what we call used to have the employment exchanges, which used to be once upon a time the repository of unemployment and then sending names for employment and so on. Practically, they are they have no job today. So it has been identified that they will be the single window agency to keep track of what the uh, the youth wants, their needs, 
the needs of the industry, match them, and then do the counseling for the, for the, for the youth to follow a particular path. And after that, once they go into training, even to track whether they are employed or not employed, or whether they are usefully employed, even for a certain. So there has been a tremendous uh, work which has been done. The work is in progress today for the skilling area. But one question mark which even there has been raised is the quality. As I mentioned to you, the quality of education, numbers today we have, but it is not numbers which are important. What is important is numbers along with good quality. And that's why the McKinsey report or the other reports are always talking of unemployed, unemployable persons, people who are coming out, so many lakhs of engineers come out, but not even 10% are employable and things like that. Now that needs a major thing, for which both AICT, the MHRD, both have taken major steps for revamping the quality of education system, particularly in the higher education bracket. I am not aware of what is being done in the lower education, so I am not giving that uh, data to you. But certainly on the higher education segment, bring innovation and R&D to improve the quality have been the bad word. I hope I gave you some picture. Hi, my name is Adira Jayakrishnan. I am a student at ISP. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you, sir. So my question is, as a DRDO scientist and the chief scientific advisor to the Indian Ministry of Defense, you have always been a proponent of developing our own technologies instead of fielding proven state-of-the-art imported systems. Given the history of minuscule outlay of defense in India in, in the budget, what have been the key initiatives of Niti Aayog to address the concern of self-sustenance and self-reliance in the field of defense? And as a member of Niti Aayog, how, how uh, your role has been a significant, uh, how has it played a significant role here? See, you have to go historically on this subject. Uh, till the Niti Aayog was formed, Defense used to be a non-plan expenditure. It's only after Niti Aayog has been formed and the distinction between plan and non-plan has vanished that defense has some relationship with the planning process of the country. Otherwise, it used to be in a standalone planning done by the armed forces along under the Ministry of Defense. They have a plan, integrated defense perspective plan is there, which is a roll-on plan for 15 <coughs> years and so on. But Participation of Niti Aayog in the present activities of the MOD is very limited at the moment, I can, I can say. And as an individual who has been part of defense for almost 40 years, I would say in two and a half years I have not been able to contribute uh, significantly to tweaking or doing anything because it's the momentum of the old process which is still continues. That is as far as I as far as the indigenous content is concerned, certainly we are pushing our agenda in the three-year vision plan, which we have uh, evolved from the uh, Niti Ayo. Many of you might have seen it on our portal now. It uh, is very clear that uh, we have identified core areas in which higher indigenous push has, been, has to be given. And there, the two sectors, the tactical sector and the strategic sectors. The strategic sector countries doing very well. But it is only in the tactical sector that we have to make a major leapfrog. And all those areas have been identified, whether it is bulletproof jackets or the, the guns and the ammunition and, and the non-lethal weapons and all, even, even things which are needed for the paramilitary forces for fighting the uh, insurgencies and things like that, they have been identified. So to that extent, we have laid out a visit. But it has not gone beyond that, I can only say that. Doctor, um, I am Raghu Babu. I mean, this is very, very abundantly clear. It's not the economic uh, growth, it is economic development and inclusive growth. I mean, it is, it is abundantly clear from Niti Aayog and the government that we have to look at this very, very seriously. And, you know, a couple of initiatives which the government has taken, JAM, you know, the Jandan accounts, Aadhaar and Mobile. But do we have a data today? I mean, how much of this initiative started showing up in, in the inclusive growth? That, that's one question. The second question, I mean, if you see the NPA problem, you also have mentioned the, we have 10,000 crores of funds for the MSME sector, but only, you know, only 1,000 crores have been dispersed. Is the appetite less or is the systemic issues? You know, I mean, according to me, it is the systemic issues. There is a lot of appetite. 
I mean, traditionally, the problem has been either you take NPA or you take the MSME, MSME fund availability versus disbursement. There are the cultural issues, the structural issues, while the government's policies are fantastic mm -hmm. in the implementation and the cultural thinking on the, you know, on the ground. You know, that, that is where the disconnect. I mean, what are we doing to see, fix this, so that, I mean, what we put as a policy is also happening on the ground. Thank you. See, the question is, uh, it is not that uh, systemic issues are with respect to funds not being provided or with the excessive governance which is coming in the way of it. Basically, culturally, India, in the particularly MSME and manufacturing sector, has been a follower. We have not been initiators at any point in time. We have always copied technologies, we have brought technologies from outside and set up industries. <laughs> to that extent, the speed will be governed by what is available from the global market. And hence the MSME's demand for the extra funds, for the extra new agencies to come up is not purely because of non-availability of the money. It is because of their own capability to generate new ideas and come up with new schemes. That is a very clear indication. I know it very well that companies are, are not able to take go beyond a single product company. They do not want to even go for a second product or a third product. Because in Hyderabad city itself, I have been responsible for promoting almost 40 to 50 industries during my missile days. But when I see them today, they still continue to remain in the same cocoon. Now, it is not because they don't have funds from the government. It is mainly because they always look for outside support. And outside support today's world is not easily available because it is coming in different ways. It is coming in terms of FDIs, it is coming in terms of, it is not flowing down to the MSMEs, it is flowing to the corporate sectors and that is one reason. As far as the implement, impact factors of these schemes are concerned, some numbers I gave you that there are, there are advantages, but these numbers keep changing every year. For example, the penetration of digital India, the you know, how many bank accounts have been opened, how much is the increase in the, you know, um, per hectare output. These are all, every year they are coming. There is an increase because many sectors there has been increased. But some sectors, for example, the climate resilient crops. Yes, we are not doing well. Reason, outreach programs of our um, education, of our agriculture universities or, or, or our, um, uh, you know, national laboratories which are working in agriculture. These outreach programs are not yet becoming tax heavy. Slowly, people are using the WhatsApp messages and things like that. Chandigarh and Punjab, they are doing better. Maybe in Andhra, they are doing better. But there are states like Bihar, there are states like UP, uh, where this kind of penetration is not there. So overall growth is not perceptible. <coughs> but uh, spikes are there. All right, this will be the last question, and after that, I have one for you, sir. Sure, please. Okay. Thomas, uh, I'm a financial planner and a technocrat in financial planning. I learned from Gita, Quran, Bible, and other scientific things, and uh, I attended your class last time in FAPC. Uh, and uh, I reached your class by 9.40 today to learn from you. My question is, uh, uh, the more the things are changing, the more they are remaining same. But uh, our Prime Minister Modi is really making efforts along with people and guidance from you people. My issue is direct tax code, something mentioned by Vijay Kelkar, that uh, for a premium, the sum issued should be at least 20 times, has been finally brought down to 10. A significant step need to be taken by all the insurance companies that if a layman pays a premium of 10,000 10, rupees per annum, the cover should be at least uh, 3 lakhs. Such step is required also to uh, improve the uh, uh, some services to the common man when, while he is living and even in case of his death. <coughs> I think uh, people like you must uh, take this forward. It's a good suggestion. It's a good suggestion. Yes, sir. And uh, the good thing is, I have seen that four insurance companies, uh, SBI, ICICA, HDFC, Max, they have come forward for uh, protecting the cancer patients who are not cancer patients now. Because the data says that 17 lakh women are going to face the cancer by 2020. Such similar steps should be taken in uh, giving the sum issue times of the premium. Yeah. So I expect people like you can. It's a good call. suggestion. Thank we'll you, take sir. Care, take yeah. care that, yes. With your permission, sir. Just <laughs> right. one last question. Thanks. I'm Venkat Srinivas Reddy. I'm a social scientist. 
it's an honor to listen to your lecture sir uh, recently uh, swaminath nayar economist had uh, raised a red flag regarding the highly subsidized solar uh, power is going to kill the uh, thermal power uh, sector and which will in fact lead to a uh, huge npas in uh, with banks and banks might collapse i do not know whether it was been uh, discussed in uh, niti aayog at uh, length but that is a very major problem so i think i would like to know how you are going my to my views yeah, yeah. i Thank don't you. agree <laughs> very simple that that was a quick answer quick answer <laughs> i don't agree to what mr swaminathan ayer is talking because it's a very clear indication that thermal power shall remain about today is about uh, 67 on coal coal based uh, i'm talking about 67% to about 47% in even in 2047 so where is the problem yes there are issues of solar power there are issues of solar power today's paper also talks about it that the way at in which we are doing these power purchase agreements they are unviable and unless the state governments take proper measures they are likely to put into problem assets which will become non functional over a long period of time the 25 years is a big issue reliability of the solar cells over 25 years is a big issue maintaining that power at 2 rupees 44 paisa is a big issue and then the disconnect between the discom which is supplying power through the main grid because the grid connectivity is required at 244 and what the other fellow is giving at 3 rupees 60 paisa there is a these are the issues which are going to be detrimental and to that extent swaminathan i am right but to say that thermal power is going to get affected by that that is not the issue i thank you everyone for the questions i would uh, i have i have one last question okay. so this is very specific yeah. uh, one of the things that niti has done in addition to uh, being quick on action is really uh, you know what you mentioned providing information ranking yeah. how are the states doing on variety of things whether it is health uh, you know productivity education uh, so two questions on that is uh, is that working is that is that helping uh, let's say if we look at fdi uh, there used to be this concept that oh india doesn't work now your information says go to telangana go to ap go to gujarat so is that actually getting the bihars and jharkhands and uttar pradeshs of the world to begin to mobilize better it and, is it and is. the second is how can educational institutions like isp you know play a role in that process of uh, helping let's say improvements in in education and public services is there a role for us no oh, yes okay. the first one is uh, by bring, in fact this is a very very concerted effort of niti aayog today to take the best practices of one state to the other state in fact i have visited uh, kerala i visited uh, chatisgarh mm. and uh, jharkhand you know jharkhand is one of the sure. underdeveloped uh, despite mm. such natural resources mm. and we have taken the best practices of say gujarat best mm -hmm. practices of uh, say telangana or mm -hmm. andhra pradesh and told them with respect to irrigation with respect to say um, uh, you know agriculture reforms land reforms leasing laws and uh, there is uh, awareness today mm -hmm. and they are then we are trying to set up meetings between the the officials of uh, that state with these states and mm -hmm. then trying to make sure that certain amount of transfer of know how mm. in each sector takes place so this is happening and this is a good way measure in which uh, match making we are doing in this way as far as education is concerned i think uh, the institutions have to play a major role mm. one of the major thing that i can only say is all educational institutions have to be part of the skill development program have to be part of the innovation cycle mm. have to be part of increasing the r&d in their own uh, system mm -hmm. and uh, whether it is 
participating in the Atal Innovation Mission which the mm. government of India is putting or the Setu program which is putting. I think your participation is absolutely essential. But not only in that way, I think your participation as an extended arm of Niti Aayog also is very important. For example, you have very highly qualified people who can do research work for us. We have about 35 to 36 outreach institutions identified. I think ISB is one of them if I am not wrong. But mm. many are there, like IIM, a couple of IIMs mm, are sure. there, some of IITs are there, some uh, nation institutions are there, some NGOs are also there. So I think these institutions are being tasked today to help us solving mm. specific problems. So that could be one role for educational institutions uh, to be part of the NITI's program. Because NITI is a small setup. Sure. Whereas the country's think tank, if it has to become, it has mm. to be, have a participation of all the great thinkers of the country. And that is where you guys come in. Thank you, sir. I'd like, you, like to thank you for a great and very comprehensive uh, presentation. Thank I think you. it's, uh, it was large in scope, it was large in ambition, it was thank large you. in things that, that need to be done. And um, so it spurred a lot of questions. I also want to thank the audience for very good informative questions and the honest one-word answers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, with that, uh, you know, we do have to draw this uh, session to a close, unfortunately. And uh, once again, sir, thank you so much for gracing us. So we have a small memento as a token of uh, our appreciation, and I would request the dean to hand over the memento. Thank you Dr. Saraswat and thank you all, see you in the next edition.